So as we start to discuss rotational motion, uh, there's a key concept that uh, we have to talk about. So, and that concept is called the moment of inertia. And so the moment of inertia is analogous to mass when we discuss linear motion. So one way that you can think about mass in linear motion is that mass, especially inertial mass, Uh, describes how hard or how much force to start something moving. So if you have something that's very massive, you would need to impart a large force to it uh, to make it have the same acceleration as some mass that has a much, that's some object that's much less massive. So moment of inertia is similar. So you're, and the moment of inertia is represented by the capital uh, letter I for its variable. And it has units of kilogram meters squared. So if mass describes how hard it is to get an object to start moving, uh, moment of inertia describes how hard it is to get something to rotate. So for a large moment of inertia that would correspond to something that's hard to rotate and a low moment of inertia is something that's easier to rotate. So the most basic concept of inertia, so if you, so this is the moment of inertia for one mass is m r squared. So if you have some mass m and you want it to rotate about this dotted line and it's some radius r away from the axis of rotation, then you would use this equation to calculate what its moment of inertia is. For several masses, let's say we have the same dotted line, but now we have several masses. M1, M2, M3, M4, and maybe they're all connected by some massless rigid rod. Now, if we wanted the moment of inertia, we can just sum up over I all of the masses, MI, RI squared. So of course these are all, so this would be R1, R2, R3, and R4. So they're all varying masses at varying distances, uh, but basically you can calculate the individual moment of inertia for each mass and then add them together if they are a system of masses that are all rotating together.
So if we use this for our basic formula from calculus, you'll know that we can go from a discrete summation like this, so summing up a bunch of individual but distinct objects to an integral. And I'll do it over the masses, integrating over the masses, r squared. And so this, this is the moment of inertia for discrete masses. And this is the moment of inertia for a continuous shape. Like if you want to calculate the moment of inertia of a sphere or a cylinder. And so I'm going to show you how to do those in a second. So We've seen the moment of inertia for one mass. We've seen the moment of inertia for a set, a system of individual masses. And now uh, we have a formula for the moment of inertia for a rigid body. So continuous shape or rigid body. And so now let's see an example of how to derive the moment of inertia for a solid cylinder. Okay, so for a solid cylinder, we'll start off with this definition, dm r squared. Um, we'll remember this equation that mass is the density rho times the volume. So if we assume that rho is constant, so it has the same density no matter where in the object you are, then dm equals rho dv. So let's substitute that into our equation, r squared rho dv. And we're integrating now over a volume. So we can convert this integral into a triple integral. I'm going to pull out the rho because we've already said that rho is constant. So we can pull it out of the integral. Now we have the integral of r squared. Um, since we're doing cylindrical coordinates, the or since we're doing a triple integral, I'm going to choose cylindrical coordinates because we're dealing with the moment of inertia of a cylinder. So the symmetry of the system uh, dictates that it would be easiest to do this integral with cylindrical coordinates. And so for cylindrical coordinates, the dv element becomes r dr d theta dz. The z component just goes along the length of the cylinder from 0 to l. The theta goes around the circle that makes the face of the cylinder 0 to 2 pi. And the r just goes from 0 to r. So here's our cylinder that we're trying to find the moment of inertia of. It has radius r and length l. And it's going to be rotating about uh, this axis. 
So this is the axis of rotation. So the L and the R are where, so the, the radius and the length of the cylinder are where we get the limits for our integration. Okay. Rho integrals rho to r integrals zero to pi integrals zero to l and then we had r squared times r so that's r cubed dr d theta dz so the we can separate these integrals since none r doesn't depend on theta or z. So zero to r, r cubed dr, and integral zero to two pi, d theta, integral zero to l, dz. Okay, so now this is three pretty straightforward integrals. So the integral of r cubed is r four over four, zero to r. The integral of d theta is just theta, and then going from zero to two pi, just get a two pi. And then integral of dz is z, going from zero to l, gives you an l. So this is rho, big R to the four over four times two pi l. Okay. Now, we'll substitute what rho is. So rho is the density. So density is defined by mass over volume. And uh, we can do this because we said that rho is constant. So the mass of the cylinder divided by the volume of the cylinder, the volume of the cylinder is the cross-sectional area times the length, so pi r squared L. Plug that in, m over pi r squared L. And I guess we'll use big R pi r squared L, r to the four over four, two pi L. So now we can start canceling some stuff. The L's cancel, the pi's cancel, the R squared and the R4 leaves an R squared on top, and the two and the four leave a two on the bottom. So we're left with M R squared over two. So this is the moment of inertia for a solid cylinder. Okay, so that was one derivation. Now let's see what the, let's do another derivation for a common object. So let's do the moment of inertia for a solid sphere. Okay, so this is gonna be a bit trickier than the cylinder was. So let's draw a sphere. It has a radius big R. And the trick to doing, to deriving this moment of inertia is to take a slice of this sphere. And if we take an infinitesimal slice that we'll call dz, we can approximate this slice to be a cylinder. So we just saw that the moment of inertia of a cylinder is 1 half mr squared. So the radius of this cylinder will label as y. And 
end. So the infinitesimal moment of inertia would be one half y squared dm, where dm is the mass of this infinitesimal uh, cylinder. And so the trick is that if you stacked a bunch of these infinitesimal cylinders of varying radii together, you could build up a sphere. So this is the infinitesimal for one of these cylinders. And we want to iterate over this several times. So we're going to integrate this. So before we do that, just like we did for the DM previously, we want to rewrite this as rho dv. So now we're going to be doing a volume integral. And again, since this is a solid sphere, we're going to take that to mean that the uh, density rho is constant. Now, uh, the caution here is that you might think that we're doing a, we're going to do this in spherical coordinates because we're doing the moment of inertia of a sphere. But uh, the reason that won't work is that the, um, if you look at different cylinders, you would see that they're all different. They have different radii. Let's call this Y2. So you'll see that Y2 is smaller than the original Y that we had. And so the, the, uh, the spherical um, symmetry doesn't work if we're stacking uh, a bunch of these cylinders together. So instead, we're going to use cylindrical coordinates again. So for this small cylinder y, the volume would be pi times the radius y squared. And then because we're stacking, it, stacking these uh, thin cylinders, the variable that we're going to integrate over is z. Okay, so let me write this on a new page. di equals one half y squared rho pi y squared dz. All right. So if we, let's pull these constants out in front and we're integrating over y to the four dz from zero to r. Or I guess let's go from over the whole height would be minus r to r. So you might think, oh, this is an easy integral because y and z are different variables, but y depends on your height, right? So when we were talking about this y and comparing it to y2, the y changes with the height z. So this integral is not trivial. So if we just use the, um, think about the distance formula, we can derive pretty easily an equation for y as a function of z that looks like this. And so this is just a rewriting y squared plus z squared equals r squared, which is just your 
regular Cartesian distance formula. So going back to this one, if we square that to get y to the fourth, which is what's in our equation, we get r squared minus c squared quantity squared. So let's replace that pi rho over two minus r to r, and then r squared minus c squared quantity squared dz. Okay, so now we have a, an integral that depends on the variable z. So let's do this method. First, I'm going to expand this uh, square term. So I'm going to foil that out. The left hand is just going to become i because the integral of di is i. Pi rho over 2, the integral of zero, minus r to r. And now we get r to the 4 minus 2 r squared z squared minus or plus z to the 4 dz. So now that we've dealt with that square, uh, now we have three quantities that are added or subtracted together. So we can split that into three different integrals. So the integral of r to the 4 z in terms of z is r to the 4 z from minus r to r, then minus 2 r squared, the integral of z squared with respect to z, z cubed over 3 from minus r to r, and then plus z to the fifth over five from minus r to r. Oh, I dropped my over two. Oh no, I didn't, it's still there. Okay. So now this is z, z cubed and z to the fifth. So those are all odd powers of z. So if you plug in limits going from r minus r to r, you'll get 2r. So pi rho over 2. So this would be r to the 4 times r minus negative r, which goes to 2r, r to the 4. So I'm not going to write that for all of the integrals, but the, the pattern stays the same. So this would become minus 2r squared times 2r cubed over 3 plus 2r to the fifth over five. Okay, so then we'll simplify all of that. Pi rho over two, and then this is two r to the fifth minus four r to the fifth over three plus r to the fifth over five. So we can combine all of these terms because they're all part of the fifth terms. We'll do uh, the lowest common denominator of 15 between three and five. So two r to the fifth. So if we want to convert that into something with 15 in the denominator, it would be 30 r to the five over 15 minus 
uh, multiply the top and bottom by five. So 20 r to the fifth over 15 plus um, multiply top and bottom by three, three r to the fifth over 15. Okay, so now they're all over 15. So 30 minus 20 is 10 plus, oh, I think I dropped my two. Yeah, there should be a two in front of this. So this should be six. So 30 minus 20 is 10 plus six is 16. So we get pi rho over two and then 16 r to the fifth over 15. Uh, so we can cancel, simplify this to get pi rho, eight pi rho over r to the five over 15. Now, just like we did for the cylinder, we can replace this row with the mass divided by the volume of a sphere. So volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So this is 8 pi over 15. Rho is m over 4 thirds pi r cubed times r to the five. All right, so the pi's cancel. The eight and the four leave a two on top. The 15 and the three leave a five on the bottom. So you get two fifths m r to the, oh, and then the, the five and the three cancel, it'll leave a two on top. So two fifths mr squared. So that's the moment of inertia for a solid sphere. So now that we've seen how to derive the moments of inertia, uh, in the next video, I'll show you how to take the moments of inertia and what happens if you want to rotate around an axis that is not through the center of mass of your object. And so we'll talk about that in the next video. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Peep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.